Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale on, well, we didn't get a victory last week, but Arizona played Washington close to the tune of 31 to 24, and Shane and I were there to see it. So plenty to discuss this week. Plus later in the show, the professor, Matt Moreno, is going to join us, talk a little basketball as we have some news with a commitment, a decommitment in football, and of course, obviously the red-blue game that we'll get to with him, plus college football picks. Shane has been on a tear lately, so you might want to listen to him over anyone. But Shane, Ooh, let's advice. start out. Let's start out with your standouts yeah. for this yeah. week before we get into everything else from Saturday. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I, my first standout's going to be uh, my good friend and, and uh, co-host, Sierra Cohen, for inviting me to the game on Saturday. It was good hanging out. Uh, first time I've sat in the, uh, in the seat with the seat backs in the end zone. Um, I used to always, uh, when you had to sit in those slabs, I used to always rent the, uh, the seat backs that they give you. Never did. did. Uh, you have to do it this time. I like the seats. It was my first, uh, experience in the end zone. I think at Arizona stadium ever. Uh, and it was a good one. So I uh, appreciate it. Fun hanging out. And, uh, it was nice oh, that, was. uh, we saw at least a competitive football game, which we didn't think we were going to see after the first uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, as far as standouts, um, a uh, couple of the, some easy ones to pick from. I, I want to start with T-Mac. Uh, Tedero McMillan, who was just uh, tough as nails against uh, Washington, mm-hmm. two touchdowns. Uh, you and I saw it. You know, he got a little banged up, I think, in the fourth quarter. Uh, and at first, I thought, you know, I was watching him look. I thought he was like motioning to come out. He was actually motioning to stay in. Like he was waving off Jed Fish and his staff, like, I'm staying in the game. And Jed Fish talked about it after the game that, that he he wanted to stay in and he made some more big plays. So uh, he's probably going to be a hundred percent against USC, but who is this time of year, middle of the season. So uh, he was outstanding that, uh, that survive connection between him and Noah Fafita uh, was phenomenal. And I uh, certainly uh, expect that to continue. Also want to mention Traden Stukes who uh, had a uh, fumble recovery that unfortunately did not count. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and I, you and I talked about it at the seats as far as whether that should have uh, countered or not. I think that was a classic ruling on the field stand situation. If it was ruled a fumble on the field, it would have been, uh, that would have stood as well. Uh, so Arizona got a bad break there and Washington scored two plays later, of course. Uh, but Stukes, great hustle play by him to, to get on the ball, uh, move away a Washington player and, um, and recover it. So, and just to stand up to the defense as a whole, uh, they, they got smoked the early in the game, three touchdowns on Washington's, uh, first three possessions, and then gave up 10 points the rest of the way. You know, yeah. 31 points against Washington. You, you would have thought Arizona would have had a chance to win. And they, and they sort of kind of did. Um, but uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But I stand, the whole defense really is a stand. Uh, I, I got to mention as a standout, even though it's kind of a, a, a cop out because uh, the collectively they were very good, even though I still have my issues uh, with their defensive coordinator. Yeah, that was uh, definitely uh, an impressive performance in the second half. And no Michael Penix, no touchdown passes. Uh, Heisman yeah. Trophy candidate, they ran it in four times. Um, Washington, interesting offense to see up close in person, but Arizona's defense hung in. Yeah. And I think that we can only hope that they do the same this week uh, in Southern California. Now, it is time for our usual buy or sell, which is presented by Ice Shaker. Uh, you can see that on the video stream. If you are watching, go to iceshaker.com. Use promo code Wildcat Country, capital W, capital C, Get five dollars off. How or- versatile is this, by the way? I'm sorry, you you can finish your ad in just a second, Eric. But I had coffee in this on the drive down to Tucson, and now I've got water and it's cold. It is it is a versatile uh, cup. And look for a new uh, new information about a new product from our sponsor, from the 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 founder of Ice Shaker, Chris Gronkowski, here very shortly after our first segment. And there you there you have it. As well as uh wanna say go to fanatics.com Fanatics, yes. get your ice shaker there. Boy, how about that, Shane? Sorry. Nice, nice tease. All right, let's go into number one here on Buy or Sell. Uh Noah Fafita showed enough on Saturday night to displace Jaden Desla- Jaden Delora as the full-time starter if and when he is healthy. I look at it from two perspectives. I mean, I, I will buy in that I would like to see Noah Fafita be the starter the rest of the season. I mentioned that last week and nothing's changed. I mean, look, he didn't come out and throw for 300 yards and five touchdowns, like maybe some wild eyed wildcat fans maybe thought he would. Uh, but he looked the part. He looked like a, a, a guy who was, yes, on one hand, was making his first college football start and he made some mistakes. He uh, overthrew Jacob Cowing in the end zone. He had that shovel pass to, to Tanner McLaughlin. There was supposed to be to Tanner McLaughlin that was disastrous, but he made very few mistakes. He settled in. He made some great throws, some great decisions, a, a fantastic escape of a sack at one point uh, deep in, in Washington territory. So yes, I would like to see him, I think, become be the start of the rest of the season. And what I saw on Saturday validated that opinion. With that said, I understand Jed Fish's situation, uh, wanting to stick with, with Jaden Delora, who's, who's certainly 
done enough in his one and a half years at Arizona to to at least warrant continue to warrant that consideration, even though his last six games or so have not been very good. And I think Noah is a better uh, decision maker. So I will buy that he should be. I will sell, though, that it's a, an easy no brainer decision for Jed Fish because it's not. Yeah, this is a tough one. I, I really don't know where to go with this one. I mean, uh, Noah did not show me personally. He was he was poised. I get that. But I, I did not see enough necessarily to displace Jaden Delora as Arizona's starter. I think the floor is higher with Noah uh, mm. and the ceiling is higher with Jaden Delora. How about that? I, that you know what? Sense? I agree with that. I agree with that. Now, Jaden's a great, great at throwing the, the the long ball, like Jed Fish said after the game. And, and Noah definitely struggled in that area. I think he was 0 for 5 on passes over 20 yards. Other than that, his completion percentage overall was great. Uh, but certainly, uh, you you keep it simple. It's better. One thing that Jed Fish did say after the game and and or on his during his Monday press conference, I forget which it was, was that sometimes you know in a real game situation, it takes a while to get the timing down with the receivers and and to get as far as like how explosive they are off the snap. You know, with the routes they're going to run, the angles they're going to take, and that just takes a little time. Plus, again, it was his first start in in as as a college football quarterback. So I don't think that you look at that one game. It's not that you can't just say, "Well, no, Fafita can't throw the ball deep." He didn't do well against Washington in this game. Doesn't mean he's not going to going forward. So I think we have more to learn about Noah Fafita. But certainly, what I saw overall against Washington was mostly positive. Uh, it was interesting though, Shane, you put up a tweet on Wildcat country that said on a scale of one to 10, give us your confidence level and Noah Fafita going forward, which got yeah. over a hundred responses. But one of them that was retweeted was by Stanley Berryhill, mm-hmm. former Arizona wide receiver who said, bro, been the truth and was ready when his name was called double yep. exclamation. The Noah Fafita one. I trust the program in his hands on Saturday. Keep going, bro. What this sounds like to me, Shane, is that the players, uh, the majority of the players past and present want Noah as the starter over JDL. How does that play into things in your opinion? I don't know if it's going to matter as far as who does start, but it is interesting, isn't it? It's interesting that it does seem like the majority of the players maybe just flat out like Noah better for whatever reason, you know, whether it's a personal reason or it's the way he conducts himself on the field uh, or both. Uh, so, and, and that could be, that makes a difference. I just, something that judge has to consider as far as team morale and, and who they're going to rally behind. Uh, I tend to think as soon as Jaden Delora is healthy, that he'll probably get another start. Um, and unfortunately it's probably going to take a bad performance for him to lose that, that starting job again, which I don't really, I mean, I don't want to see that if he's going to, if he's going to be the starter, I want him to play well, but I think that's probably what, what we're looking at. My guess my is that he's, we're probably not going to see him again until after the bye week but he'll yeah. probably start that game and then we'll, we'll have to take it from there. But it is interesting. Yeah. It really, you just get that vibe that it seems like the players prefer Noah. Yeah. And if Noah wins one of these next two, I think he has to be the guy. And I, I don't think Jed yeah. will do that, but I think he, at that point, he should be the guy. It's I a mean, tough spot be- for Jed. I, I I do sympathize with the situation. Uh, number two, Shane, Arizona's defense played well enough against Washington to win. I got to buy it. 31 points against Washington. Yeah. That, that was a, a game that, you know, and, and Arizona's offense was clicking a bit uh, toward the, more toward the first se- uh, first half of last season. That if you take Arizona's offense from last season and put it in this game, they might have they might have won. But yeah, they they that was the the best that any defense performed against Washington so far this season, and maybe over one of the best during the Washington's current twelve game winning streak. Certainly, uh, again, Washington marched down the field the first three drives. Uh, it drove me crazy, and my and you know you you have to listen to me and you know next to you at, at Arizona Stadium uh, complain about it endlessly uh but Arizona had scored touchdown made it 14 to 7 then Washington faces a third and long it would have been a three and out and I'm screaming for Johnny Nansen to bring some pressure you know mm-hmm. because if Michael Penix is, is able to sit back there all day then he's going to complete the pass and get a first down he rushed three he dropped eight Penix had yeah. all day easy 15 yard completion Washington goes down and scores a touchdown they almost didn't because of uh, that fumble and they almost right. got the ball back, but it's things like that, you know, and I know that, that Johnny Nansen's just not, you know, he's the, kind of the opposite of Dr. Blitz in that regard. He doesn't like to take those chances and he is who he is, but I think that the defense is coming around collectively. I think the, the play calling is, is there are, as we see in the corporate world opportunities and it's, and we saw it against Stanford so many times Stanford converted on third and long when Arizona would, would uh, drop seven or, or eight guys 
and for whatever reason did the same against Washington until maybe later in the game he started bringing some more pressure and that helped. So it's the same thing against USC. You you can't give Caleb Williams time. You can't drop eight and expect it to work. It's just not going to. So uh, I, I am critical of the play calling, but the defense collectively is coming uh, together nicely and they did a great job giving Arizona a chance to win. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm going to sell this one. I'll tell you why. Arizona gave up Six of 10 third downs, which is not good, and one of one on fourth down. They gave up 474 yards against Washington, whose game plan was very vanilla. They did not do anything special. I think they did not want to give Oregon uh, next week. They have a bye this week, and I don't think they wanted to give Oregon much tape to work with from that Arizona game. I think they knew that they could win the game regardless. I I wasn't as impressed with Arizona's defense as you were. I think the lack of blitzing was a problem. Yeah. Um, Michael Penix could have carved them up all day if, mm. if Washington had done anything creatively. So I am more critical in it. Uh, listen, the defense is a lot better than it, than it had to, than it has been in, in, uh, in recent years, but I'll tell you what, I, I don't think it played well enough against Washington to win the game outright. So I'm going to sell that one. All right. Number three, Shane, we're going to do this in two parts, the stadium atmosphere. How about Saturday's crowd by yourself? I'll buy it for three quarters. No. And, and for the first three quarters, it, it was kind of frustrating because you felt like, Arizona is really one big play away from that stadium just exploding. You know, yeah. they, they got really loud in that third and long. And if the Arizona had gotten a stop there and gotten the ball back and scored, it would have been a crazy atmosphere the rest of the game. But they just weren't quite able to get the crowd into it too much. But it was a sold out crowd. I mean, it looked, it looked legitimately sold out. It was a fun atmosphere. The crowd was engaged for the most part. Uh, but come fourth quarter, and I'll start this by saying you and I left with about four minutes left. And Washington yep. was up by two scores and they had the ball. And the ball. Yep. And Arizona, uh, we listened to it on the radio with Brian Jeffries. They actually, you know, they came close to recovering that onside kick. It might have had a chance to tie, and we would have kicked ourselves all the way back home. Very much so. But so I'm not going to be, I don't want to be hypocritical here, but there were a lot of fans who left at the very end of the third quarter, and even before then, when the game was still very much uh, in doubt. A lot mm-hmm. of the Zona Zoo section left even before the fourth quarter began. And so I know it's late. But if you're, it's a sold out crowd, you know, Jetfish is begging the fans to be there and make noise. And then you leave when you, when they need you the most. So that was frustrating, but it was fun. It was kind of to me like a, like a glimpse into what Arizona stadium could become again. If this team continues to go in the right direction, because Arizona, when that stadium was full and it's a big game and the fans actually stay, it's a great environment. Yeah. I was impressed. I would buy that one. I, I agree with that. It was for three quarters. It was impressive. So I'll give you that now. Uh, fourth quarter. I mean, Usually it's halftime, so I guess I, yeah. I have to say that they hung around longer than usual. All right, um, B, uh, the in-stadium experience being better than in recent years. Do you buy or sell that? Overall, it, it's better. Uh, I you know, I, I complained about this on Twitter, so a couple things. First of all, uh, don't care for the DJ. We talked about that. I just mm-hmm. think he's obnoxious and, and, and completely unnecessary. And then there was one play, the second half, I forget exactly when it was. Arizona had a third down, like a third and short. And whoever runs the sound at Arizona Stadium decides to play music on when Arizona has the ball on third down. And then 20 seconds later, it's a false start. Now, I'm not saying that there were, there might not, there may or may not have been a connection there, but it's just a stupid thing to do that your sound guys got to know when to play music and when to not and what the, the offense operates. So uh, I, I don't know that really ties into the game day experience, but I, the stadium looks great. Uh, the concessions were, were, were good. It was, the, I like the the grab and go options they had there. Uh, everything's ridiculously overpriced, but everything is these days. So mm-hmm, Arizona mm-hmm. stadium fits right in. So uh, it was a fun atmosphere. The, and uh, it, they clean up that, you know, if they kick the DJ to the curb and uh, stop playing sound on, on Arizona's third downs, I'll like it even more. I will just leave it at that. How can I top that? Okay. Uh, Shane, number four, there is such a thing as moral victories by or sell. I won't, I'll sell the the moral. I, I think that you can, I will buy that there are certainly positives you can take from a loss. Um, at some point, you got to stop that. And you got to say, we're going to find ways to win this, this game. But look, I think Arizona is probably four or five plays away from winning this game. And they just didn't make plays that great teams make. Uh, there was the overthrow of Jacob Cowan in the end zone, which by the way, when no Fafita missed, usually he missed long, which is good. You don't want to miss short because you have a chance, better chance of an interception. So Correct. he aired on the side of caution there, which was good. And he used the check down. Jonah Coleman was great in the receiving game, by the way, we yep. even talked about him. Uh, and he, he kept it pretty simple. Uh, but you, you missed that play. The, obviously the, uh, the, the interception, uh, in midfield, um, the not, 
stopping Washington on third and long. Uh, the fumble that was almost the fumble recovery. They did get one in the second half, uh, in the fourth in the fourth quarter actually, uh, deep in uh, in Arizona territory, and they t- and they took advantage of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, they're they're just there are certain plays that great teams make, and Arizona isn't quite there yet. So. As far as moral victories, no, I don't think so. I think maybe a couple of years ago you could look at it that way. But now I, I think that Arizona is at the point now where they expect to to win those games. And I didn't expect them to win, but I think they expected to win. And I think they realized, looking back at the tape, if, if a couple of things had gone differently, maybe they could have. So my take on this is uh, fairly simple. People weren't watching this game because it was on Pac-12 Network. They mm. woke up the next morning. They saw the score. They said, hmm, what happened to Washington? Mm. So, yeah, uh, the score was closer than the game, in my opinion. Yeah. So, yeah, Shane, I will say there is a moral victory. And now this game on Saturday night uh, is on ESPN, so at least some people are going to be able to watch it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I want to see Arizona play within the spread, and we'll make our picks later in the show to see where we fit. But I think it's important that Arizona covers this and keeps it within three touchdowns. I will say that. Uh, and finally, I, you know, I didn't see much of the red blue game. Do you have any thoughts on anything? We're going to talk to Matt Moreno and he'll give us some, but anything before that, that you want to touch on. Yeah. And as much as we can really dissect anything from that game, first of all, if, if Philip Borovichnik can get open from three, he can knock it down. He won the three point contest. So, yes, he so can. there's that, that might be the most we see of him all season. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, it was good to see Umar Balo put up some good numbers. Again, it's a it's a scrimmage, basically. So you don't read too much into it. But, you know, he had a great first half of last season. And then he was kind of quiet the second half, a little bit quieter than he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was great to see him look like his old dominant self. And then uh, Kisha Johnson uh, led the scoring for the other team. Uh, and he oh, he comes in playing great. We you know he's a great defender, but if he can knock down some outside, outside shots as well. And Arizona could be a team where at least four out of five guys at any given point uh, can knock down threes that can really stretch the floor. So uh, n- nothing but positive things came away with no injuries, which is good for a scrimmage. I, I that's, I'm sorry. I've just, that's, that's about as much as you can get out of it. The fans are certainly excited uh, about the team. It was great to see. Uh, I, I think it was, so, was it sold out or very close to being sold out? Right, it was so, sold out. Correct. It was sold out. Right, so. Yeah. It was sold out. Yeah. Um, so that, now that's about it. And uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about the season. Like I pretty much always am. Let's find out what Matt Moreno has to think. The professor is going to join us here next on Wildcat Country. What's up, everyone? It's Chris Gronkowski, and football season is back. Ice Shaker is a proud sponsor of the Wildcat Country podcast. Don't forget to check out some of our new products, like the Ice Shaker with the built-in bump box speaker. That's going to absolutely pop at your next tailgate party. Let's crush it this season. Bear down. It's an extra session of class today because we have him around for two segments. It's the professor, Matt Moreno from Rivals.com. He has so many titles, I don't even know what he is anymore, but he's moving up the ladder, but he's still with GoAZCats.com. And he has been for, God knows, what, at least a decade now, Matt? Something like that? Past 12 years now, so 2011. Well, yeah, August 2011 was when I started. The very end of the, very end of the Stoops era. Yeah, uh, I covered a couple of those games, and then, you know, Got no. thrown right into the fire in a coaching search and mm-hmm. a lot of fun stuff. You've seen a lot. And uh, so if anybody knows what to talk about, uh, you know, what's going on with everything you do. All right, let's start with uh, number one, Jaden Delora at less than 100% or Noah Fafita. What would be your choice if you were Arizona's head coach? Uh, Noah Fafita, 100%. I mean, I don't, I think we've covered it ad nauseum on this podcast when I've ever I've been on going back to when he was being recruited. He kind of has everything that you need in a quarterback outside of his height. And um, I think fans got to see that a little bit last weekend. And um, it wasn't perfect. I think there's it's not like he's a superhuman and and everybody's going to have their little bumps. And it's his first real chance to really guide the offense and really get in there and be like, hey, you're the guy in this game. And so I think the the things that he didn't do well are going to be things that anybody that you see most quarterbacks go through when they're that young and uh, at least with that inexperience, I guess. But um, which I, is why I don't think Jed Fish was overly angry about what he saw. And, you know, those mistakes are going to happen and you're going to make some plays. And just knowing Noah, uh, having seen him in high school, there's times when he could make some of those plays that he tried to make, uh, you know, against Washington, the, the little flip uh, that turned into an interception. I mean, you you see plays like that work out on his high school film. And so um, I guess it's not unexpected to be like, well, he's going to try it. He, in his mind, he goes, I can make that play. I've made it before. And, uh, you know, when he's trying to maybe make a tough pass to T-Mac or something like that, they've done that before. And so 
Um, there's going to be those growing pains, but I think what you saw is someone who's very good at managing the offense, playing within the offense. And when Arizona has gone to some trouble offensively, it's because Jane Delora is a little bit of a wild card at times. And it says, I'm going to kind of do my own thing at times and go off script a little bit where if you ask, I think any coach who's an offensive play caller or defensive play caller, but in particular offensive play caller and, and the one who's in charge of running the quarterbacks, they hate that. They hate when you go away from what they want to do. And so I think you saw a lot less of that with Nofa Fafita. And I think, um, you know, right now, especially if, if Jaden's not going to be at full health, I think your best bet is going with Nofa Fafita. And I think your hope is if you're Jaden Delora that he doesn't do well enough that he takes your job because I think there is that possibility in there. That's not, I don't think he's quite there yet, but um, there's a lot of good things that he does. Matt, I'm going to go sideways for just a second because uh, Arizona had a uh, pretty big uh, decommitment in uh, Keona Wilhite out of uh, uh, South Point. Uh, the day before we're, we're talking here, which is Tuesday night, and I know you, we had, we had talked about how big a commitment that was and what it signified for Arizona recruiting in state. Uh, number one, two part question: Are you surprised by the decommitment, especially so soon after he committed to Arizona? And is this kind of a lone thing, or could this be like a snowball effect where you see some other guys decommit as well? Um, to the first part of the question, not surprising. Um. There's one school that I watch in particular, which is Washington, and that's kind of gained all the buzz coming out of this decision. They have not gone away, and they were a school that was very much involved in the process before he picked Arizona. Uh, it was one of those schools that was really pushing hard for him, you know, early on, in, or I guess late in the spring. Not really, wasn't even necessarily the summer yet, but um, late in the spring was making a really strong push. Uh, I think you're going to see Washington come through again. I think if it happens quickly, and if you see this start to really pick up, I think Washington will be the pick. I think if you're Arizona right now, what you want is a little bit more of a prolonged process. I think you want to see it take some time, have him take some visits, maybe get some other schools involved as much as that maybe seems counterproductive to what Arizona is trying to do. I think the more muddy the process gets, the more likely he, it is that he ends up back, you know, back at home and going to Arizona. So if it moves quickly and he, you know, I guess we'll know because he'll make a decision, but um, that favors Washington to me right now. And I think they're, they're a program that has piqued his interest. I think it's been very clear that they've piqued his interest. And uh, again, they've never gone away. And then, not that it's all predicated on what just happened last weekend, but that also doesn't hurt. You know, when you when you were able to watch both those teams, one that you really like, one that you're committed to, one comes out on top and you kind of see that play out in front of you makes it, you know, makes it a little bit more uh, feasible that you're going to you know end up at a school like that. But even if that doesn't happen, Washington was in a very good position. That's kind of been the word as of late was that Washington was kind of making a charge and maybe giving him some things to think about. So whether or not he made that decision to decommit from Arizona because he's going to quickly flip to Washington remains to be seen, but it feels like right now, if there's one school to really pay attention to, it's going to be Washington. Okay. And, and to the second part of the question, uh, low isolated incident or, or a, a sign of things to come. I think for right now, isolated incident, I think it could have some trickle down effect and where you're, you're talking about, obviously one of his good friends is Elijah rushing, who is Arizona's biggest commitment in this class. And, and, the thinking is, well, one is tied to the other in some way. I think it's maybe overblown a little bit um, that they're, you know, connected at the hip. And what, what one does is what another is going to do. Washington is not going to be very much in play for Elijah rushing. But maybe it opens up that door for a school like Oregon to come back around and be like, hey, your friend's not going there anymore. Look at he's going to whatever school to go play. If it is Washington in the Big Ten, why don't you come, you know, join us at Oregon and, and make that same move. And so, um, I think that's the big concern right now. Um, and maybe big concern is overstating it. Um, I don't think it's a huge concern for Arizona right now. I think they feel pretty confident in where they're at with Elijah Rush and, and the rest of the in-state guys as well. Um, obviously, you have Dylan Tapley, an Arizona State commit, uh, recently visiting Arizona as well. So if you get him, it doesn't really change the whole process in terms of what you're doing in-state recruiting-wise because you now have another top five uh, player from within the state committed to you if he ends up making that flip. So um I don't think it hurts them, you know, greatly in terms of in-state recruiting or what they want to accomplish there. For for right now, I'd say it's a one-off, but um, you know, it's kind of to be determined at this point. I, I don't think it's going to be one of those things that sets off a chain reaction. Now you no longer have all these guys that you thought you had at one point from in-state, but uh, it's definitely something to monitor, and we'll kind of see what happens. And again, at this point, you know, uh, Keanu Wilhite is not committed anywhere. And he could very well end up back at Arizona. I don't think that's likely. I don't think that's how it ends up playing out. But I think until you know for sure, you know, it could be could be for nothing. But I think for now, it's just something to monitor. But I don't think it's anything to be concerned about if you're an Arizona fan that it's going to have kind of uh, this adverse effect and you're going to lose a bunch of guys because of this one decommitment.
Okay. So Matt, and, we see. Oh, go ahead, Shane. No, I was just going to ask on one more question uh, on on the defensive side of the ball, Matt. Just uh, your overall opinion of this defense uh, certainly looked great in the second half against Washington after a slow start. I've been a little critical of Johnny Nansen not you know not bringing more pressure on third and long, which has led to some long conversions. But be that as it may, are you surprised at the progress of the defense to this point, just based on all these guys you've been tracking for so long? A little bit, but also to your point of the things that you're you know picking apart about John Anson, it's kind of good to be in that conversation because you're talking about specific things as opposed to like getting blown out or True. you know just easy plays over the top or things that are they're smaller things than what they were you know a year or two ago. So uh, I think that alone is a sign of progress, and I think that's a positive thing for Arizona. But um, it feels like they've made that big jump between last season and this season, which is what you want to see, and, and sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why. You kind of need to give coordinators and coaches an opportunity to kind of do their thing and, and put things in place. It's difficult as fans to look at that and go, yeah, you just want it overnight. You want things to change and go, well, if he's a good coach, he's going to change them overnight. But it's taken steps. And I think you're starting to see some of those players that he was able to get when he first arrived really start to make an impact. I think that's been positive for Arizona. And again, you just have guys who have learned the system and now, um, you know, the calls, what they need to, where they need to be, what they need to be doing are kind of more second nature. And you have to give credit to a lot of the transfers who are, you know, making an impact as well, because they have to learn those things on a dime. And when you look at, you know, across the board and, and listening to a lot of coaches talk, a lot of things become more simplified because of the transfer portal, because they just can't be as intricate as they used to be because especially defensively, because there's so many new guys that they have to integrate into things. And so I think um, there's probably a little bit of that as well, where things are a little more simplified. You can just drop in, you know, somebody who's had a, you know, Taylor Upshaw who's had, a successful career and, and give it, give him a chance to, um, you know, do some things. Daniel Hamuli have, you know, had a successful career at Washington, let him just drop him in and have him uh, make an impact right away. So I think um, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different factors that are in play, but uh, it's definitely been impressive. I mean, it, it, every week it feels like I come back to, well, if the defense didn't do that, what would the score look like either way? Um, you know, if you look at even this last game, holding Washington without a passing touchdown, I mean, that's a really big deal. And that's not, it's something that nobody else has done this season. Might not happen again this season. Who knows? I mean, it's 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 rare that that is the case with this Washington team under Kalen DeBoer and with Michael Penix Jr. And so um, I think all positive things, I think there is another level that they can reach. But again, the fact they're even having that conversation is a positive thing and a positive development for the team because the defense for several years has been kind of the issue with this team. And to, to talk about that being flipped and you go, well, now the offense kind of needs to pick things up. I think that's a positive thing for Arizona as a program. All right, Matt, I want to uh, switch back to NIL for a second. We see that Arizona is playing uh, USC this week with three guys that were on Arizona's roster last year. From what you know as of, uh, as of right now in the Pac-12, where does Arizona, like, are they towards the top of uh, NIL donors, would you say, are, so that they are able to be competitive with some of the bigger schools like a USC? Is that from your understanding? Yeah, I mean, I think the Pac-12 in general feels like it's kind of behind in a lot of ways. Um, and obviously you can point to a lot of different things and you can probably point to a lot of the reasons why many of these teams are no longer going to be part of this conference. Well, 10 of the 12 will no longer be part of the conference. I think that plays into it as well because, um, the PAC 12 in general feels like it's behind in a lot of areas. It doesn't come up as much as you would think, um, with a lot of, especially if you're not talking about the top three or four programs, you know, within the league, it just doesn't come up very much when you talk to recruits and when you talk to, you know, even transfer players, it doesn't really come up that much. And so, um, I think Arizona has some work to do. Um, I think it's not at the bottom, uh, which is positive, but I think, you know, it has some work to do if it wants to get into that upper echelon and, um, you know, Nike with Oregon is going to be a difficult kind of hurdle to climb. Um, you don't necessarily have to go head to head with them anymore, but, um, once they get to the big 12, I think it'll be a little bit better outlook for them, but, um, I think there's some work to do. And, and I think, I don't think all those decisions that with those guys that went to USC were directly tied to NIL. I think some of them were, and I think that didn't hurt. Um, but even USC, there's been that talk of, um, you know, how much NIL money do they have and, and how, uh, fruitful has it been? And there's been those conversations about maybe it hasn't been as impactful as they would have liked. And they maybe don't have as much money flowing in as, as a program like Oregon or, or, uh, you know, Washington or some of these other schools. And so, um, I, I don't think that played as much into those decisions as people think. I think the opportunity for, especially a couple of those guys who, who are from LA and, and or Southern California and wanted to just go back home and play, for the team that they rooted, you know, uh, rooted for growing up, I think that played a big part in it as well, and the opportunity to, opportunity to play on a big stage and compete for a national title and all those things, I think, played into it as well. But um, I don't think Arizona is in a horrible spot. I think there is a 
you know, a good amount of NIL money involved. I think there's, you know, opportunities for a lot of these players. And I think that's why you're able to see them kind of do the things they're doing because you just can't be successful if you don't have that NIL component right now. And so I think, you know, the byproduct of, of all that is that you're seeing Arizona become more successful and do some more things, hang with a team like Washington and potentially have a chance to win that game. And so um, I think they're kind of probably in the same boat as a lot of programs right now where they're like, it's fine and it's okay. And we're doing, you know, where we want, we're kind of, we're afloat right now, but we want to be better. And I think if you go ask any college program that any college football program that right now, that's kind of where it's all at. And I don't think anybody's happy with where they're at sure. in terms of NIL money, because uh, you know, that's, that's going to be a big part of what any decision is uh, coming to right now. And so, um, you know, I think there's room to grow there, but I, I don't think they're as bad off as some of these other programs. Yeah. They need to regulate it. I mean, and we've talked about that with other guests in the past. I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous that it's a free for all, but we'll, that's for another day. All right. So I've asked you this every time I think you've been on. I say predict Arizona's record at the end of the season. So right now they're three and two. They have six of their next or five of their next six games are against ranked teams, Colorado not, and then at ASU to finish the season. Does Arizona win six games and make a bowl game as of right now, in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. I think the, I think last week showed me a lot. I mean, I, I've had some pretty big concerns about the offense and it wasn't amazing against Washington, but um I think the defense has made a lot more progress than I anticipated uh, at the start of the season. And I think that kind of balances out, you know, some of the deficiencies on offense. And I do think the offense is eventually going to figure it out and get it going. I think there's enough pieces in place. I think there's a strong enough play caller and leader in Jed fish that I think he can get this thing figured out and they're going to be able to produce like they want. And it's crazy because you look at, you know, they haven't been bad. They've been able to score points. I mean, they're scoring in the thirties a lot of times, but the issue is, that everybody else is scoring 40 and 50 points every week because the offenses are so prolific within the Pac-12 and the quarterbacks are just so good. And, you know, you, you can point to a team even like Washington State and Cam Ward. Uh, he's been amazing. And, you know, they're just putting up such huge numbers and everybody across the board is putting up such huge numbers that you can't just be kind of a run-of-the-mill offense. You can't even be pretty good. You have to be almost great, a great offense to really have a chance to win in this conference. And so um, I think Arizona is getting toward that direction. I think once they figure out some things offensively, especially that quarterback position, and figure out if is it going to be Noah? Is it going to be, you know, Jane Delores? Is he going to settle in and maybe stop, you know, making as many mistakes and they can get dialed in a little bit more there offensively? Um, I think that'll kind of determine kind of where they end up. But I think seven wins is very achievable. I think at this point, I do think it would be a letdown for them to not reach a bowl game. Um, you know, you're you're halfway there already. And I think um, you know, that's where this thing is trending towards. So um, I do think that it's very feasible. I think it again it would probably be a letdown if they don't make it, but I think you know, I think seven wins is, is within grasp if you if things fall into place. And again, I maybe didn't even think that last Friday, but watching what they did Saturday, I mean that that felt like a different type of game for me for them. And and, and in past years, I think it wouldn't have been that close. I think there would have been a lot more issues going on with that, with especially with the backup quarterback in there. Um, so I think that those are all signs of progress, and and I think. Um, it just feels different. It feels like this is that kind of transition year where you're going, okay, they're going to make progress that you can visibly see. And then after that is when they get really good and you're going, that's a good team. And so it feels like they're kind of in that area right now. And so I think, yeah, I think they, they should make a bowl game. And I think seven wins is definitely within grasp right now. All right, Matt, I got one more question for you. And it is a basketball question because Arizona uh, and Tommy Lloyd landed a big commitment uh, just earlier today as we're recording with a uh, center number, the number 96 ranked overall player on rivals, Emmanuel Steven. Uh, he committed to Arizona over say, Kansas, USC, Miami, and Michigan, a pretty uh, impressive group there. Uh, now a very nice looking as of now, a three man class for Tommy Lloyd already going into the next season. Uh, what do fans need to know about Emmanuel Steven? Um, give him some time offensively, but he's one of the best defensive prospects in the class. I mean, he led the EYBL in blocks uh, average nearly three blocks a game over the course of close to 20 games uh, over the spring and summer travel season. Um, going to really make an impact right away defensively uh, on the glass as a rebounder. That's what you need to expect from him. If you're expecting him to come in and be a dominant big man, you know, offensively, it's going to take some time. I mean, there is some there are some things he has to work through right now. It's going to be a lot of lobs, a lot of stuff around the basket, cleaning things up around the basket. That's where his points are going to come from. Uh, he only averaged a handful of points in the EYBL season. Um, so give him some time offensively, but I think you're going to like what you see from him right away, defensively and rebounding wise. And that's kind of a, a nice piece for Arizona to have. Um, you could always, you know, supplement that with transfers, but to have someone who comes in and you know what his skill is and you know what he does well, 
and he does do it well, uh, that's a positive place for a coaching staff. And I think the one, I think the comparison you're going to see is Christian Coloco when he first arrived at Arizona and you go, okay, what is he like? He's kind of a little bit, you know, wiry and, and even you know, Emmanuel Steven is not wiry. He's pretty well built and he kind of looks already similar to a college player. So that's not going to be you know, necessarily the same, but in terms of his offensive de development, that's going to need to happen. I think you're going to need to see that from him. And it's going to be a very similar situation where you go, you know, what can he do for me in season one? Well, it's, he can get your rebounds and he can block shots. It's kind of what we felt like with Christian Coloco. And then, you know, a couple years down the line, you go, wow, he's an offensive weapon. Who's able to you know score 20 points at, at one point in time. So, um, you know, this coaching staff had a lot to do with that development. Um, and so I think that's, if you're looking at it, you go, that's the similar path you want to take with Emmanuel Steven is an opportunity to grow as an offensive player, but he's not going to be someone that has to ride the bench or is going to take time to make an impact in any way. He's going to be able to, you know, make those plays on defense and, and help you change shots and, um, you know, be a threat defensively in the paint, but uh, just give him some time offensively to, to grow and develop. But the bigger thing is that he's now the third player from the, the Paul George elite team joining Carter Bryant, joining Jamari Phillips. So they come in as a group going, we've all played together. We kind of know what we're about. And I think that's a, a really great benefit for, for any team, but for Arizona, what they want to do, I think having those guys understand each other's games and having been through some battles together, I think that's going to be really huge for, for Tommy Lloyd and the staff and, um, you know, can help them kind of grow this next group because it's, you know, it's a really impressive class. Uh, they're all different. They all do different things, but I think they can all complement each other pretty well and fit in with what, you know, the rest of the group that, that Tommy Lloyd has built and uh, just a really impressive class. And this was kind of the class. It's not necessarily super elite, but it's so hard to build those types of classes now because of, um, you know, all the paths that these guys can take. You can go to the G League, you can go overseas, you can do so many different things that it's not, you know, the heyday of the Sean Miller era where every five-star was picking a college. It's just different. And every top player is picking a college. I mean, it's just different. And so it's a little more challenging to build those types of classes. And so um, I'm not going to say this is as, as good as you could have hoped if you're Tommy Lloyd in Arizona, but it's pretty close. And, and you know, this is to build this type of class in this day and age, it's impressive. And so I think it's kind of that first building block. And I think you're going to really see what this group can do and really see the success of this recruiting class on the floor uh, in the years to come. We'll see how long some of those guys stick around, but uh, one in particular. But, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really positive step on the recruiting front and maybe settle some people down about, you know, Tommy Lloyd's recruiting efforts and his abilities as a recruiter. Yeah, including this guy right here, uh, who has been critical of Tommy Lloyd's recruiting, and uh, I'm eating crow right now. So good, I'm I'm glad to be wrong, and thanks Tommy for proving me wrong. You know, we'll talk about scheduling another time. I've already asked you about that, Matt. My last question for you: We haven't talked about this yet on the show. Is the red blue game? Um, you know, I didn't see much of it. Uh, any impressions from that? Just how good did, did you see anything that that could tell you how good Arizona can be this year? Yeah, I mean, I think the the transfers in particular are the guys that you're like, okay, this is as advertised, which is what you hope. And I think, um, you know, Keisha Johnson, you he looked like a guy who has played for a national title and was part of a team that, you know, had a lot of success. And so uh, you look at all those guys, somebody that I've really liked all along, and he's kind of gone up and down the rankings. And I think people maybe forgot about him a little bit. Uh, KJ Lewis, um, I really believe a, a lot in, in KJ Lewis and his abilities. I don't know how much he's going to get a chance to, you know, see the floor regularly, regularly this season with as much talent as they have at the, at the perimeter on the perimeter and at those wing positions. But, um, I really like his game. I think that he's a very talented player. I think he's going to do very good things at Arizona. I think he fits the system very, very well. Um, and I thought you got to see that a little bit more during the red blue showcase and then, um, length. I mean, you just got to like the length that they have. We'll see kind of how it all pieces together. Um, you know, once the season gets rolling, but you, there's a lot of length and a lot of size inside and they can, as we know, uh, you know, Tommy Lloyd knows how to use all that length and, and has made well with, you know, having uh, big guys inside and, and running the game through them. But, um, you know, I liked what they, what they brought overall. They look like a team that is ready to make a run. There's a long way to go until that happens. And until we mm -hmm. see what that comes, how that comes to fruition, we've seen teams like that before we saw a team like that lose to Princeton. Yep. And uh, so you can never get ahead of yourself at this time of year. And it's yep. it's hard to not get excited after a red-blue game. Everybody, I think, looks pretty good every year. And there's always those guys in the red-blue game. They go, he was amazing. Why did he do nothing else the rest of the season? So yep. you can't you can't fully commit to saying, okay, they, this is the type of team they're going to be based off of that. But um, I thought all the pieces are there. It looks like a very, very talented team, um, kind of at every level. Returners, starters, uh, returners, newcomers. 
Uh, I thought it just looked like a, a very complete team. And then even Umar Bolo, which I think a lot of people had concerns about him on the overseas trip. I mean, he comes out and looks pretty good in that game as well. So um, it just feels like a very complete team. Again, a long way to go. We'll know more about this team, you know, once December rolls around. But um feels like they have all the pieces in place to make a run. Now it's just up to them to go make that run. Dane's uh, already looking for Final Four tickets mm-hmm. as we speak. Uh-huh. Nope. You know, you know about that. That's Matt. you. Right, but, yeah, <laughs> no comment. Uh, so uh, Matt, coming up next, Shane's on a heater right now. Fourteen five and one against the spread in the Amazing. last two weeks. Can you beat him? We'll find out here on Wildcat Country. So as I referenced at the end of the last segment, Shane has cut my lead in half from eight games to four. I am over 500, baby. It's you are. I, I, I'm 29, 19, and two. Shane is 25, 23, and two. Take and it. our guest pickers are 500, 24, 24, and two. But now the professor is going to take his shot to see if he can outpick the both of us for week six in college football. All right, Matt, I'm going to start with you uh, for this first one. It's the Red River rivalry, and Texas is a six and a half point favorite against Oklahoma at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Who do you like with the points? I think I like Texas. I mean, I don't want to overthink it. I think Oklahoma is a very good team, and I think that they definitely have a shot, and I'm tempted to to take those points. But uh, Texas has been on a roll, and and it's it's hard to – they're going to stumble at some point. I don't think it's this game. I don't think it's, you know, a game where they're – you know they're going to be fired up. Um, you know, last one is members of the Big 12. Um, I like Texas, and – I don't really have any good reason for it. I just think they've been playing well. I just don't think, I do think they're going to stumble at some point because we can't let Texas be back. We just can't. So (laughs) they're going to stumble at some point, but I just don't think it's this week. Shane. Pretty much what Matt said. Yeah, I I agree. I I actually, for whatever reason, I just have this idea that Oklahoma is not as good as, as, as the record shows. I just don't, I don't know why I haven't seen that much of them. I just have that impression. And I think Texas is an uh, elite team or at least more cl- uh, close to it. Uh, this is a neutral site game, so no advantage there one way or the other. But I think Texas finds a way to win by seven to 10 points. So I, I say they're going to cover. I actually like Oklahoma here, and I wouldn't be surprised to see an upset. I Oklahoma has been dominant thus far this season. Their offenses look great. Their defenses look great. I think uh, I think it's eight of the last 10 games between these two teams have been one possession games. And I think we're going to see nine out of 11. I think Oklahoma keeps us close. I'm going to take Texas close, but Oklahoma to cover. All right. LSU is a six and a half point favorite off a loss at Missouri. I have no idea how they're still ranked after giving up, what, 50 some points to Ole Miss. Yeah, I guess. But Missouri's undefeated. So we have a battle of ranked teams here. Uh, at it uh, in Missouri, uh, who you got here, Shane? LSU minus six and a half, or Missouri plus the points? Yeah, LSU is a tough team to figure out. They've been they've been a very Jekyll and Hyde team. I feel like this is a game where uh, they they take out their anger on a Missouri team that's probably peaked or a bit overrated. They're on a, off to a great start. So uh, it, as weird as it is to see like kind of an even matchup uh, with a road team, a six and a half point favorite, I'm actually going to lean LSU in this game, Matt. I'm going to go opposite. I think I think Missouri gets them. I don't trust LSU. There, there's just something about them that I just don't trust. And that's nothing to do with who their quarterback is or anything like that. But uh, I just don't trust them. And I think I think Missouri, I'm a little bit more bought into Missouri than Shane. So I think I think Missouri pulls off the upset. Or, yeah, I think they pull off the upset. I'm going to say. Taking them outright. I'm going to say they, I'm gonna say they pull off the upset. Okay. I like it. I like I like going out on a limb as a six-and-a-half-point dog. All right, here's the first Pac-12 game of the week that we're going to talk about. Washington State, who's had a fantastic season, facing their first real road test, not counting Colorado State. They're at UCLA, who's a favorite by three and a half with a freshman quarterback. Matt, I'll start with you. UCLA minus three and a half. Can they cover against an unranked Cougars team? I'm going to go Washington State winning this as well. I mean, I just, Mm. again, similar thing. I don't really trust UCLA. I've watched them play a lot uh, this season, and there's just something about their team that I kind of think they are who they are. I don't, it almost feels like they believe that there's another gear they can reach, but they haven't done it yet. I think there's been some questionable decisions at times from the coaching staff and playing games with the quarterback position and not fully committing to their freshmen for whatever reason. And it's made for some kind of weird, interesting games and games that should are closer than they should be. So I really like, I already mentioned them already uh, earlier on, but uh, Cam Ward at Washington, at Washington state is just really, really impressive. And, um, that offense, you know, with new offensive coordinator, they have it rolling. I really like what they bring to the table. I think, uh, 
you know, Jake Dickert is making his his case for potentially being Michigan State's next head coach. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, again, I just think they have things rolling. I don't really trust UCLA. Again, I think Washington State wins it outright. Shane? Yeah, I think the narrative is that UCLA is supposed to be good and at any moment they're actually going to show that. And that Washington State, because they usually, you know, they'll start off great and they'll, you know, get to seven and five and eight and four. I feel like this is a different Washington State team with Cam Ward and they have the better quarterback, UCLA, I think. You know, I think that you fast forward to the Arizona UCLA game down the road. I think that looks like a win- more winnable game than did maybe even at the beginning of the season. So uh, I'm going to take Washington State. Last week, there was a line of Oregon State minus three and a half at home against Utah. One loss team ranked in the top 10 at a home team that had just come off a loss. And what happened? Oregon State smoked them. I think UCLA wins this game by a touchdown. And I think uh, we're not going to see like, what was it, 63-59 or whatever it was four years ago when they last played. It was one of those wild games on uh, those Pac-12 after dark games that that we, you know, we're going to miss. But I think UCLA wins this game by at least a touchdown. I I can't, you know, I, I think the line tells me something here. Uh, maybe I buy into it more than I should, but I'm going with the Bruins here. All right, let's go back to the SEC. Alabama is a two and a half point favorite at Texas A&M where they lost a few years ago. I'm taking the Aggies outright. I think they're arguably a better team. I mean, listen, Matt can tell you they have how many five-star recruits are on that on that Texas A&M team under Jimbo Fisher. I think they win the game outright against the, not as good as usual Alabama team. How about you, Shane? Sorry, just muted there. I'm going with Bama. Uh, I I think that they they've they finally uh, righted the ship. I think that it's just crazy to think that it's almost unfathomable to think that Alabama is going to be a three four loss team. I don't think they're going to be. I think Jimbo Fisher and uh, finds a way to screw up a And M just about every year he's been there. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take Alabama. Matt, uh, I hate to keep coming back to this theory or this working process that I go through, but. I just don't trust Jimbo Fisher. <laughs> like yeah. there's just something about his teams that I just don't trust, you know, the way they operate. And if there is a coach to trust, you know, it's Mr. Saban out there in, in uh, at Alabama. And so I think they had their hiccup. Uh, I'm assuming they've had very, very difficult practices ever since that hiccup. And if there's somebody who's going to motivate him, uh, you know, I, I would imagine it's him. And so uh, I think Alabama wins. I don't think there's, I, again, I just don't trust Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M. I think, I think Alabama wins pretty handily. Okay, interesting. All right, well, I guess I'm on an island uh, in three of these games thus far. This is going to be fun. Uh, here's another one I'm probably on an island with. I should trust the the line here. Uh, Kentucky is at Georgia, who is a minus or is a 14 and a half point favorite. I'm rolling with Kentucky, who's 4-0 against the spread against Georgia in their last four games. Matt, do you agree with me? That's a lot of points, 14 and a half. This is an interesting one, I think. And you look at the way Georgia played Auburn last week, and I think that's why I'm going to probably go with Georgia. Because that was too close for comfort for Georgia. I mean, they, Auburn barely beat Cal, and then you almost lose to you know to that team. And so, I think that's being what they've gone, being the team that they that has gone through what they've gone through and, and has won championships and done all that. I think that's the scare that they need to kind of get them uh, get the ship righted and get everything kind of going in the right direction. And so, um, I just Kentucky's a good team, and and it's it's an interesting pick. And I've thought about picking Kentucky, but. Uh, I just think that little scare last week against Auburn is what Georgia needed to come out and, and cover the spread. Shane? Yeah, I remember I said last week, Eric, that I felt like you know, last year Georgia had a, had a tough game, like a random, like just kind of letdown game against Missouri, but they found a way to win. I felt like the Auburn game was going to be like that last week, and it was. Georgia's past that now. I think that there was a wake-up call. They're, they're loaded with talent. They're number one for a reason. I think they're going to cruise and, and cover the spread against Kentucky. Okay, uh, we'll go through this one quickly. Notre Dame is a six and a half point favorite at Louisville. They have won their last 30 games against ACC teams and have covered in the last 10. So I'm going with Notre Dame for that reason. How about you, Shane? Yeah, I'll go with Notre Dame as well. I, they survived Duke somehow, some way after that that really, really tough loss to um, uh, to Ohio State. I think that was all they needed to really kind of get back in the swing of things and and, and get over that the hump of that, the emotional hump that they were that they were dealing with there. So I, I think Notre Dame's got all the momentum. I'm going to roll. I'm going to uh, roll with the Irish. Matt? Yeah. Yep, definitely feeling the same. I think that, you know, that little bit of a scare is what they needed. It feels like they're kind of building some momentum. Um, and I just, I just, yeah, I think they're going to win this game and and cover the spread. All right, Fresno State, we're doing a Mountain West game. Shocker is a five-and-a-half point favorite at Wyoming. Now, uh, Fresno State is pretty darn good, guys. They could be the uh, representative in the Fiesta Bowl. We might see them against a Pac-12 team later this year in the Fiesta Bowl. I love them this week at Wyoming. I know Wyoming is, is you know, it's tough to beat up there, but I think Fresno State is that good. We saw that against ASU. I'm rolling with the five-and-a-half. Matt, what do you say? 
I say, and Jeff Ketford, we trust. I mean, I think he's been, you know, very good for, for their program. I think, uh, you know, he had a lot of success at Cal and, um, I just think that they're in the right position to to be that type of team. And they feel like that hot pick of, you know, that, that type of school, that group of five school that, you know, just gets the job done. And, uh, it is a difficult game at Wyoming, but I just think that, um, you know, they have too many pieces at Fresno state. And I think they cover the spread easily. Dane. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Uh, I, I think this is gonna be a closer game than you guys think, but I still think Fresno finds a way to cover. I like Fresno okay. state by a possession. Okay. I like that one. How about Oregon state minus nine and a half at Cal Matt? Ooh, this is an interesting one. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, Cal has been an interesting team to watch this season. Uh, I mean, they come out and score 58 points and then really just can't figure out their offense the rest of the way. Uh, I, I Nine and a half is interesting because Cal does have a very, very good defense, but I think Oregon State covers pretty easily in this one. Shane? I, I like Oregon State to win. It's a tough line, though, and Cal really could have and should have lost to ASU uh, last week. So uh, I, 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 I'm leaning toward Oregon State to find a way to cover, even though I don't feel good about it. I'm going to roll with the Beavers. Yeah, I'm going with the Beavers here by a couple of touchdowns. I think Cal uh, got lucky to hold on against ASU. ASU arguably outplayed him, but I'm going yep. with Oregon State to cover that nine and a half. All right, speaking of ASU, Colorado's only a four-point favorite on the road, Shane. Don't really understand this line. Is it a trap line? I, you know what? Well, first of all, I think Colorado has said that it's been the highest rated, uh, has had the highest rated game for the last five weeks. I don't know that trend's going to continue against ASU. With that network, yes. Yeah, well, there's that too. With that said, I actually think ASU is going to win this game outright. I, wow. I just don't think, I, I, I just get the feeling that, that ASU is due for a victory. They, they played USC tough. They played Cal tough. ASU is not a great team. Colorado really isn't either, even though I know they played USC tough. I think ASU finds a way to win this game. Matt? I want to pick ASU uh, just because I I think that, that again, similar uh, along the lines of Shane that, you know, I just think they're due for that win. They've been getting close every week, um, but I just don't see Colorado uh, losing three in a row um, yeah. coming off those last couple losses or last couple losses, the last couple weeks. And so um, maybe if it was a higher point spread, um, but yeah, I, I think Colorado wins it pretty easily. Yeah, I do too. I think Colorado wins by seven to 10 points here. At least I think I don't see ASU stopping this Colorado offense. They really didn't slow down Caleb Williams that much. You know, Colorado's defense, nothing special, but I think the four points is a gift. All right. Final game to talk about. I'm going to start with you, Matt. Arizona is a 21 and a half point underdog at USC. Give me a few thoughts and a score prediction. I've seen worse Arizona teams keep closer than 21 and a half. Uh, against USC. I just think that this is a better Arizona team. I think there's going to be some added fire or whatever you want to call it for some of those guys, you know, for their former teammates now that are at USC that are going to, I think Arizona's guys are going to want to you know, show up for that game to prove that, Hey, you guys should have stuck around and, uh, you know, played with us down in Tucson. So um, I don't think Arizona has enough firepower just yet. Again, I'm still, still have my concerns about the offense. And so I don't think there's enough firepower to outright win this game, but I, I think that, you know, I'll take the points and, and I don't think that USC is able to cover. Give me a score prediction. Um, yeah, let's let's go 41-31. 41 31-30. Okay. Shane, how about you? You know, Arizona's come close to beating USC a lot of times since they actually last beat them in 2012. I don't think it's going to be the case this time. I think Arizona's catching USC at exactly the wrong time. USC has had a week, two weeks now to hear about how bad their defense is, how they're not really a championship contender, and now they're back home and they have something to prove. I think it's bad timing for Arizona. A uh, key matchup to watch potentially is either Tedero McMillan and or Jacob Cowan against Christian Roland Wallace, who's having a mm -hmm. great season uh, at USC. Uh, good chance Dorian Singer scores a touchdown because that's just how things work for Arizona. Uh, I think, unfortunately, it's just wrong place, wrong time. I think USC rolls. It's not in indictment on Noah Fafita or what Arizona is doing, but I like USC to win 48 to 20. 48 to 20. All right. Well, yeah. I'll just keep it quick here. I think Arizona has shown us something defensively. Now they're running into a buzzsaw. With that said, uh, Arizona is one of two teams in the country to play to be under their projected point total by Las Vegas in all five games this season. 0-5 to the under. USC, I think it's 13 of their last 14 games to the over. I think Arizona keeps this one closer for a while. I'm going to say USC 42, Arizona 24. Don't think, you know, Arizona is going to come close to winning, but I think they're going to put up a respectable effort. I can't say the same next week about Washington State, but we'll talk about that next week. It's going to be a very interesting two weeks before the bye week. But Matt Moreno, the professor, thank you so much for joining Shane and I. Always a pleasure to have you on and great intel as always. And now everyone, you can put your pens down. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. Thanks for listening. And as always, bear down.